year is 1973. T-Rex is a band in the UK that released in March a song called 20th Century Boy. It was a pretty popular song that reached number three on the UK singles chart and stayed there for three weeks straight. The song's incredible rhythm and opening guitar riff, coupled with the beat of clapping hands, energizes a feel of rebellious youth. This is fitting because the main character in the first few pages of our story takes over the school's PA system and blasts this song as loud as he can. As the holes fill with the riff of otherworldly energy, a young man hopes for something, anything to change. I want to introduce you to a manga that surprised me with its mystery, its deep themes, its terrifying villain, and group of everyday people trying to save the world. Despite its flaws that I will talk about, I wanted to make a video to express my appreciation for this story. Now sit back, grab a drink, as I tell you about the story of the 20th century boys who saved the world. To start off, I want to discuss the manga for those who have never read it. So if those of you who have read it and want to get to the spoiler territory, just skip to right here. I provide all my thoughts on the manga, including the things I loved and also really didn't like. If you're familiar with the mangaka Naoki Urasawa, you know that many people consider him one of the most prolific writers in the manga industry. His ability to plant the seed of a story chapters ago, which will sprout again later, is remarkable. I genuinely can't believe he doesn't play Stardew Valley 24-7. At this point in his career, he'd already made a huge name for himself with the success of the manga Monster. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that many people believe it to be his best work. I could personally attest to its quality by saying that it's pretty good. According to extensive research that did not begin with Wikipedia, Urasawa came up with the idea for 20th Century Boys while taking a bath. As we all know, the tub is the greatest place to come up with the greatest stories. While his video box played in the other room, he overheard a UN conference mention a group of people and praise them with the words, without them, we would not have been able to reach the 21st century. Urasawa was wondering to himself who these people could have been and what they did to deserve such recognition. Urasawa formed a picture in his head of these heroes. Finally finishing Happy and free from the crunch of creating two series at once, Urasawa was hesitant to start the process again, but he was determined to do so before the end of the 20th century, as the year 2000 was approaching. So he started drawing and submitted the manga for publishing. As I discuss this series and its amazing potential, keep in mind the author's ability to juggle two different series simultaneously for a few years, both of which were of decent quality. To give a general idea of what 20th Century Boys is actually about, here's the pitch. When you were little, you watched and played stories about good guys and bad guys, heroes and villains, cops and robbers as examples. When playing these games, you were required to choose between playing as the good guy or the bad guy. Now what would happen if you took the childish concept of good and evil and made it believably realistic? Could we create a reality where a villain who takes over the world is no longer just a child's game? And the protagonist of our story is Kenji. Kenji works at his family's convenience store and takes care of his niece Kana due to his sister's disappearance. After making a delivery to a home where the residents have gone missing, the protagonist notices a symbol drawn on the side of the house. This discovery leads him down a rabbit hole of conspiracy that I can't even begin to describe how deep it goes. But this specific path leads him to discover that the symbol is not only something he has seen before, but is actually personally linked to his childhood friend group and their adventures as children. Kenji learns more about this secretive group using this symbol, who are led by an enigmatic figure known as the Friend, a leader whose identity remains unknown to us throughout the entire narrative. This mystery is one of the driving forces behind the main plot. Who is Friend? What do they want? And why are they trying to recreate these fictional stories? It is clear in the premise that the villain is someone Kenji knew from his childhood group of friends, but who is it? This villain has extensive knowledge about our protagonist and is recreating a villainous plot scene by scene that Kenji himself and his friends had come up with for a group of fictional villains called the League of Evil. They had written all the details in a book called the Book of Prophecy. Now these prophecies are not just small acts committed by delinquents. Oh, no. This cult is a group of hundreds growing into thousands. They aren't lining trash cans on fire or smacking mailboxes with a baseball bat. No, these prophecies include a virus that attacks major cities, draining the blood from those inflicted, a terrorist attack on a nearby airport, and finally, the introduction of a 50 meter tall robot that destroys Tokyo. All of them extremely childish and unbelievably impossible 
start to become more possible. Urasawa nails making the ridiculous seem so believable and in turn, terrifying. He achieves this by making it seem the unreal has become a reality, yet tricks the characters and you into almost believing it. But more on that later on. To encapsulate what is great about 20th Century Boys, besides just the premise, it's Urasawa's writing technique, introducing new characters and tying the plot with them. If you've read any other Urasawa work, you know that he's good at this. For 20th Century Boys, Ocho is a personal favorite of mine and a great example. Of the writing techniques, Urasawa uses what I like to call the, uh, where the fuck am I technique. He uses it in Monster, but the idea is similar to the get in late, get out early technique of storytelling. Putting the audience in the middle of a conflict with little to go on and have them slowly catch on to what is happening. Now Urasawa will do this all the time to introduce new characters we don't know, who seem to have no relation to the story so far whatsoever. But he'll go to the extreme, taking us out of Japan where all our characters are and dropping us smack bang in Thailand. We follow this guy called Shogun, a mercenary paid to help those hunted by the local mafia. As we follow, we learn his Japanese origins and that he was the one who drew the symbol of the friend as a child, finally learning that he is Ocho. While learning this, the story places Ocho in situations where he learns about the friend's reach in Thailand. We receive a new badass character and have him catch up to the plot while getting new info on the friend's plans. Urasawa is switching lanes on the highway, reciting the social network script in his head and downing his McDonald's all at once. He also just likes to drop in random panels now and then as well, leaving us to wonder if this has already happened but we don't know what it means or it has yet to happen and we don't understand what it means to us yet. There are two actually at the beginning in the manga. The first scene shows a young lady who wakes up to the sound of rumbling and sees out the window a large ominous shadow walking toward her. Foreshadowing? Mm. The other scene is the UN congratulating and introducing heroes who saved the world from annihilation and guaranteed humanity's survival into the 21st century. Those heroes' faces are not shown. Urasawa is also a really big fan of time skips for this manga, as it's needed to tell the story considering it spans decades, and it's one of the best things about 20th Century Boys in terms of its structure of the plot. The story of the manga is sectioned into three parts, based on what year we follow the characters from Kenji's childhood in 1969 and beyond to the year 2000. The first part takes place between 97 and the year 2000, and it's what I've touched upon so far, and we'll discuss a bit before I enter the major spoiler territory. Introducing the first major theme of the story is heroism. And the real hero's call comes after Kenji understands that the friend cult needs to be stopped as they're responsible for the death of someone he knew. Learning that his suspicions were correct and that he has the knowledge in his past to stop this, he is faced with the call to adventure. Now, thinking back to Luke Skywalker, for example, call to adventure and saying yes to the chance to go out into the stars. Urasawa instead is trying to ground his characters in true realism. So instead of saying, yes, I'm ready to go out there, Kenji decides to run the fuck home. <laughs> like an everyday person, he struggles with the weight of what is being asked of him, saving the fucking world. Just think about that for a second there. If someone asked you as the best possible option to save the rock in which humanity lives on, would you even consider saying yes? Are you prepared? How could you do it? Why does it have to be you? 20th Century Boys shows the struggle with the weight of the responsibility, skipping A New Hope and us going straight to Empire Strikes Back, which is kind of cool. Now for Kenji, he does what any normal human would do in this situation. And that is to immediately slay on his electric guitar until the strings rip apart. Perfectly normal human reaction. But this plays to Kenji's character as the guitar and music are what give Kenji the courage to feel like it's actually possible to do this. In his own words, he feels invincible with this. This gives him that small amount of courage he needs to try and face the friend and stop him. And let's just say like Empire Strikes Back, things don't really go too well for our heroes. Spoilers ahead. One of the big turning points is when Kenji tries to confront the friend himself and is met with obsessed and dedicated followers who adhere to their leader's whim, calling him their friend. It's comedic, but also really fucking scary. Kenji also learns that the father of his niece, Kana, is the mysterious leader standing before him, creating a new personal tension for our protagonist and our first big twist. I say first because this rabbit hole of a story fucking takes some sharp turns, man, let me tell you. A few nights later, Kenji's convenience store is attacked by the cult's followers after they had just succeeded 
in bombing Haneda Airport. Now broke, no home, and having nowhere to go, Kenji retreats into a life living as a criminal, as the following attacks made by the cult are subsequently blamed on him. The next theme shown in the story is every oppressed gamer's favorite, society. More in the sense of how people can be influenced by a common goal or a common flaw. The people who follow friend all have this feeling in their lives missing that is an easy one to exploit. The feeling of belonging or feeling important. Telling someone that they are your friend and you matter to them is the key to this cult's plot. The effect this has on Japan society is shown as the plot moves further. In part one, after Kenji goes into hiding, he contacts friends to help him fight, including Ocho, who comes in from Thailand. When he arrives, he sees that Japan has changed in the year 1999, noting people are more suspicious of each other and that Kenji being labeled a criminal seems extreme with a lack of proof. That is because by this time, the friends have slowly entered into Japanese politics, now a party of small renown, and known as the Friendship Democratic Party, or FDP for short. This gives them some authority over the police, especially when one of the head investigators in Tokyo is actually a member of the cult before they got into politics. They indoctrinate the lost into their ranks and slowly conform people to comply through fear. But it's interesting to show the realistic approach of a villain's goal for world domination. He didn't plant a bomb to threaten parliament. No, the friend joined parliament. He inserted himself within the government and charmed people by being a good friend instead of an intimidating boss. And then he bombed parliament so that they would become the major government. How far their power over society scales depends on what part of the story we are actually in. To summarize the best thing for our characters in part one is showing how much they fail to fight this opponent. And what I mean by that is expressing how hard it is to do the heroic thing and stand up against this threat when it's a handful of people versus thousands of loyal fanatics. Kenji, despite avoiding capture by the police, cannot do much to get the attention of people and show them what is actually happening around them nor warn them of the next threat, a huge robot that will decimate Tokyo. Actually tries to locate the robot with Ocho, but only arrives after it has been awakened and receives a message from the friend, who continues to taunt Kenji like they are children playing a make-believe game. Yoo-hoo, Kenji-kun, let's play. Unable to see his face makes him such a compelling villain and an eerie creepy one, speaking in riddles and subtle lines hinting at the truth of his identity treating the lives of any as just a speck in the cosmos and a necessary rejection for his plan to continue. He sees this all as a game to be played and will not stop until it ends. Kenji rallies friends to his cause and prepares to face this robot on New Year's Eve before the beginning of the 21st century. They don't know how they'll save the world, but trying is better than nothing. We've met them before, but they finally show their merit. His friends Maruo and Yoshitsune, along with Kenji's childhood crush Yukiji, including a few others, prepare themselves. Thousands of citizens sleeping in their beds are awoken to the sight and sound of a large shadowed beast walking amongst the flames and rubble of Tokyo. Humans are dropping dead, bleeding from every orifice of their bodies having contracted the global virus that is now being spewed from this mechanical monster. The government is scrambling to figure out what to do. No one is coming, and the end is near. So a group of everyday people, including a security officer, a salaryman, and a convenience store owner, walk forward, ready to save the world. And then we cut to the year 2014. What? Wh why? When? Ha we were there. We were there at the end, and then we skipped the battle by 14 years. I thought I had a page stuck together, surely, but it turns out it's true. Right before the final battle, this manga card did a time skip by 14 years. But that is the beauty of this manga, in keeping with its mystery. Now having skipped the climax of the battle, we have to piece together what happened while also understanding what happened in that time between the time skip. What happened to the robot? Where are Kenji and the boys? Did the friends disappear? And so we start with part two. It is here in chapter 50 that part two of the manga begins in the year 2014. The future, if you will. And our main character is a teenage Kana, the niece of Kenji, an already revealed daughter of the friend born to Kenji's vanished sister, 
Kiriko. She carries with her a cassette of her uncle playing songs in the streets of 1999. He isn't very good, and that is actually mentioned a lot. Bakana has the energy and embodiment of his character. She, in my opinion, helps push the plot forward and is a proxy for how we remember characters of the previous arc and helps link them together. And it's also through new characters that we learn about what happened on the eve of the year 2000. Like I said, where the fuck am I technique? He loves it and he won't stop doing it. And he does it even more after a 14 year time skip. Don't think you're done. But to talk about this new Tokyo, we have to talk about Samurai Jack. You know the story. He gets sent into the dystopian future, finds himself in a world ruled by the bad guy. But what if he went through time and found that all the people around him didn't know who the bad guy was, and that the world seemed almost exactly the same? What would that be like? Could you tell the difference at a first glance? Well, for Kana, after having a slightly average day of serving Chinese food, dodging bullets from the mafia and hitting them over the head with a frying pan, she walks with a bowl of ramen through a memorial and sets it down at a display plaque, commemorating those who helped save the world on bloody New Year's Eve. She wishes her uncle Kenji a happy birthday. And as she eats, we see on the ground a large scale design of a symbol. The same one Ocho drew when they were little kids. And you're thinking at this point in the story, no, 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 did they win? The only person who we see who was there at the night of the battle was Yukiji. One of the main members of the boys at the beginning of the story we see is actually still alive in this future, but has lost the fire of the person she used to be. She acts as a foster parent to Kana in order to protect her from the friends, who are now loved and revered as the saviors of Tokyo and the world. They have gained so much power, they are in fact now the majority party of the Japanese government. Due to some <coughs> foul play. You recall the panels at the beginning congratulating those who saved humanity I mentioned earlier? Well, it's revealed that they were the highest members of the group next to the leader, friend himself. This man is heralded as a hero and a saint. Even the Pope loves this man. He is credited and loved for stopping those who were piloting the evil robot on the night now known as Bloody New Year's Eve. An event so historic, which is now taught in schools based on a new curriculum of history which tells of a terrorist group known as the Kenji Faction and their wish to kill innocent people. The world we are in now, the future that our heroes fought for, is a warped one twisted by the friends as a means to their ends global domination. I said that one of the themes of this story is heroism, and that is still very true. But as you now know, heroes don't always win. And those who we're giving the title of hero to are probably the farthest thing from that. Part two's bulk of 20th Century Boys is the majority of the story by chapter count alone. So there are many new themes that the story implements when reintroducing characters who we have lost and contrasting them with who they used to be. We've already seen a fiery Yukiji who is now a docile protector. Let's look at someone else. To get to them, Urasawa introduces the mangaka character named Kakuta, who is imprisoned after breaking the new censorship laws on manga. To summarize, they put this man in jail for drawing legal anime titties. More specifically, he broke story censorship guidelines implemented by the FDP. Treated like a social terrorist, this artist is taken to Tokyo's own Alcatraz and sentenced to lifelong confinement. And after a scuffle with the guards, he is sent down to solitary confinement where an inmate called the Monster dwells. So dangerous, he is chained by every limb to avoid any chance of escape. Put in the opposite cell from this beast of an inmate, Kakuta reminisces his love for manga and tries to speak openly to the monster who reveals himself in Kakuta's cell. This magician inmate dislocates his limbs every time to get out of his chains and gives Kakuta the chance to escape with him using a Shawshank Redemption method of digging into the sewage pipes with a rusty spoon. Kakuta accepts so he can one day draw manga again with his friends who live in an apartment with a young woman who plays terrible rock music loud as she can, named Kana. Hearing that name, the monster tells him he named this tunnel after her, as she is our only hope. When asked who he is, the man replies, Shogun. 
This is one of the greatest character reveals I have ever read in not just manga, any story in general. The way, the build up of making us believe it could be him and then it turns out it actually is and introducing in a way as if we're meeting him again for the first time because it's not the same character like he is before. Just like when we first met Ocho as Shogun, we learn about his situation and his reaction to new info that is important to the reader and done in an engaging, mysterious way. He just does it again even better. This man's incredible at this. And adds that thread of fate. Who knew the man who is imprisoned is friends with the artists in Kana's building? And when I mention contrasting characters, what I imply now with the time skip is seeing Ocho differently when remembering who he used to be in Thailand and post that. He is withered and jaded, but still cares for his loved ones as they are all he has now. So much so that he is dislocating himself to escape his shackles and creating tunnels by hacking at a brick wall with a rusty spoon for 14 years, all the while referencing escape cinema like The Great Escape. How are you not reading this manga right now? Using a time skip and contrasting characters, Urasawa introduces the next big theme, which is time. He likes to skip around with it, but it's something we forget as it changes us all. Especially other characters, for example. Re-meeting Yoshitsune and Maro, who are fighting the friends in their own way, also shows how much they have changed from Bloody New Year's Eve. Yoshitsune now runs an underground group of people who have lost much to the FDP and know the truth. It's shocking to see someone who was once a timid child, a man who felt he was never great at his job, but is now leading people even though he continuously tells himself that he is just holding out until the rest of the gang returns, as he's just not cut out for this. Also, that mustache? Dude. But the choices he makes and the confidence he exudes are a far cry away from the salary man who accidentally ordered 4,000 boxes of toner as opposed to four. He is now calculative, committed, and resourceful. Even slowly remembering things about the gang's childhood leads them to understand more the plans of the FDP. Myro's character was a surprise as well as to where he ended up. Being a producer for an artist who is forced to sing propaganda songs for the FDP and is the closest to the enemy. So much that he has the opportunity to kill himself and the friend but can't bring himself to do it as he never wants to stoop to their level and let innocent people get killed in the crossfire. A nervous wreck of a shop owner is now quiet and searching for an answer to reach the friend and see his face while trying to link the gang back together again. As you can guess after the battle with friend on the eve of the year 2000, the explosion of the robot in neighboring buildings separated all of them and kept them divided due to their notoriety with the public. Time changes us and with a glance, we can see how growing up can be another theme that links to our story. Discovering who you are and the retrospection age can give you of who you used to be. Depending on what arc of your life you're in, the tournament arc, the first child arc, or if you're not feeling too happy, you are in what we call the third impact arc. You start to look back on the kind of person you used to be, no matter how far, either in admiration, disgust, or general animosity. And for the future, you maybe have expectations of who you will be that may or may not work out because of life or evil cults. The series is able to show that by making the central theme of having stories representing characters as kids, then again in the mid thirties, and then again when they are middle-aged and have clarity of what happened to their lives and recall where they wanted it to go. Kenji was a leader as a kid and fell in love with rock and roll, a couple of stints and gigs, but at the end of the day, it never worked out and the band broke up. And after the disappearance of Kenji's sister, he was the one taking care of the convenience store. Ocho worked hard in school, got married, and had a family. But he was so caught up in the now of his life and working to become successful that he was never around for his family, which resulted in his son dying tragically from a car accident because he thought he saw his dad across the street. Both character situations of being in prison and lost reflect these things very well. I've been talking a lot about characters and not so much about some of my favorite scenes. The reason is because the cast of 20th Century Boys is king, and there are too many good scenes. To touch again on the society theme in part two, people who respect the FDP and friend go to the new diet building where they can wait in lines and go pay respect to friend himself, the hero. And these lines go long, man. 
Television is censored as harshly as manga, where the characters all act like they're on some Sesame Street program, including talk show hosts of the biggest networks. All of them are showing the FDP symbol somewhere on their programs. School's history education and social classes are affected as they are taught the extra criteria of Bloody New Year's Eve. And of course, the objective view that the FDP saved us all. Funny enough, the pages of this event are extremely short for such a large scale event in human history. It shows more of how the villains just control information rather than through brute force. I will say though, there are moments where that is very much less true. And the FDP definitely really do take the term, kill them with kindness to heart. Another MVP of a character is Kyoko Koizumi. After deciding to do her essay on Bloody New Year's Eve by accident, she randomly gets the chance to interview Kami-sama, who knows the truth about the FDP. She decides to drop it out of fear for her life, but by then it is too late and the school is ordered to take her on a field trip to Friendland. That's right, you have just been exa- I mean chosen of a rare few to be a part of a land that changes minds and lives forever. Create friendships that last a lifetime. Kill and murder the evildoers of the Kenji faction in our virtual simulation. Plus your own suite, where past lucky few have stayed. Where are they now? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Urasawa literally said, let's take the Mickey police and let's just take it way too far. A site where young are tested and brainwashed to become the future FDP leaders of tomorrow. Koizumi has possibly the most dangerous exposure to the antagonist as someone who has no clue what the fuck is happening. Attempting to escape the theme park, she finds the cleaner of the park, which turns out to be an old Yoshitsune, who is actually trying to get inside to use the VR system, as he thinks there is a clue as to who the friend may really be inside. In order for her to escape, she has to win the VR game, but the twist is the game are actually the recreated memories of friend when he was younger at the beginning of the 70s. It features young autonomous versions of all the characters of our story, Kenji, Yoshitsune and more, reacting what they did in that time period on the specific date. And this is not the last time this VR game is used to find things in the past that we needed to know further. And I think is actually a really cool fresh way to tell more of our characters as well as link us back to the young days of the 70s without just doing a standard old flashback when the character wants to remember something. I mean, remember, we are in the year 2014, the future, and anything is quite possible. The themes I've touched on repeatedly in this part and the previous make me happy as they just compound the story more, especially in part two. But I haven't talked a bit about the artwork, and that is where I think I start to understand Urasawa a bit more in his visual style of storytelling. Sometimes when I see a visual medium and I have a certain knowledge about maybe the creator or others, I can describe them by comparing them to a completely different medium. Urasawa, in this case, is a filmmaker mangaka. He cares a lot about the plot, pace, and tone of the story he's telling, and less so much about the panelling. It's not bad panelling by any means, but these are camera shots more than images that let the eye follow across the page. I think his double page spreads are few and far between, but that works to his advantage because then it allows moments like this to have an impact. He uses dialogue sparingly when he wants the atmosphere of the scene to take center stage. And that is more visually interesting than having panels go from standard squares to warped ones whenever conflict reaches its boiling point. It's not bad, but it's a very good technique that should be done regardless. I think the pace of his panels is his major strength when so many events are happening at once, and of course that art style. It suits the tone of any story he seems to want to tell. It is not too modern or old fashioned, it just feels timeless. It also lends his characters to be dynamic. Drawn the same way, characters can go from kind and charming to deeply sinister, and then vice versa to humanize our villains. Urasawa can make his scenes have that effect of characters having a fun conversation about their childhood, and then having characters realize they are in danger, creating that booming effect like there's someone in the building with us. This isn't a horror manga, but there are still some panel spreads in these scenes that made me poop the bed a little. To finish off part two and really get into talking about the villain of the series, I need to tell you how part two ends. To sum up, Ocho returns to his childhood school and discovers that there is going to be a meeting in the science lab. There he finds Yamane, the man who made the strains of the global virus for the FDP, and then enters the friend himself. 
It's a great scene with a lot of setups and of mystery about what happened in this room and who the friend is. And we find out because seconds later, Yamani shoots friend to redeem himself and he actually dies. Ocho and co escape and reunite with nearly the whole 20th century gang and the news breaks to the world. We even learn that the friend was Fukube, a traitor who faked his death on bloody New Year's Eve. The world begins to mourn the loss of an icon. As soon as you think you received your answer, Urasawa just digs that rabbit hole ever deeper. I never thought the antagonist of the series would die in an instant like that, and I bet he didn't either. People begin lining up for days to see the friend's body on a display of a bed of flowers and pray in front of it. The Pope himself arrives to give a eulogy to the friend, but it is there that he achieves the impossible. From a small cult leader to a political entity and then a global saint and activist, the friend wakes up from his death, walks to the Pope and proceeds to take an assassin's bullet for him in front of millions around the world. The assassin and the event itself, if you think it all seemed orchestrated, you would be correct. Our heroes tried to stop this from happening, but were too late. I said before, but have to remind you, villains trying to usurp the world and take it over, they try to do it by destroying it, so it's easy to take, which is what Friend does secretly, but he also solves the problems he creates. He stopped the robot he made, he stopped the virus and created another one, and he stopped the assassin he created. It's easier as we know to gain power when people trust to give it to you, when you are likable, affable and relatable, when you are their hero and their friend. Fukube's backstory is actually shown to us after this. Someone who was jealous of Kenji's friend group when they were kids, provides a lot of texture to what was the enigmatic villain of our story, and so far enjoyed this. But it started to make less sense as the friend continued to hide his face. And it's in our next part, part three, that I have to start making the points I don't want to make. So we cut to three years later. The friend takes his place as leader of the known world and lives in his fortress that towers over what was once the bustling city of Tokyo, but now is a walled city prison from the rest of the country to protect itself from the stronger version of the virus now circulating the globe. To talk about what I love, in the final part of our story, I have to disclaim that the Urasawa dick sucking is going to be a lot less of that, because I think the story begins to take a decline in the quality of some elements of the plot. So if you're a friend pilled, just know if you hear my criticism, it is from someone who really, really likes this manga. I genuinely believe this manga is now amongst my top favorites. As the title says, I want to show the brilliance of this manga, but now it's time for the flaws, and majority of them lie in part three. Because the final time skip, part three of the manga follows again the same structure as previous parts where we introduce new characters, where are the old ones, this kid is housing some injured guy in the shed, who could it be? Oh, it's Ocho. I think this formula at this point in the story becomes a little tiresome, but it does twist it in a good way because there is one character we haven't seen this whole time. For a story that talks about Kenji, references him, shows flashbacks of him, and hears him sing many times, he does not impact the story except through his past actions. Kana remembers his music after her Walkman breaks and decides to keep fighting the FDP. Yoshitsune waits for him and the others to return and carries on because it is what he would have done. Ocho recounts how Kenji never gave up on her challenge ever since they were kids. Yukiji mentions how she admired Kenji for always fighting a losing battle if it was for the people he cared about. But the last time we saw him chronologically was on bloody New Year's Eve. And even with all the info of what happened that night, now known to the reader, is still visually shrouded, which ties into Kenji and his eventual return, when we are teased with a guy driving on a bike with a guitar strapped to his back, talking about how he died, he went to heaven, and he came back. And we find him through a character we already know, a character called Chono. Previously a detective, now made an officer to watch for aliens attempting to get into Tokyo, as the FDP propaganda claims that there are aliens out there now dressed as humans who are trying to destroy us. So if you're a QAnon supporter, take notes, you'll be able to use this later on. The world is waiting for a hero to arrive. It's only when we hear a song being played on the radio after the media curfew demands no TV or radio at night. 
People can hear a man singing his heart out on the radio waves. Kenji makes himself known slowly, and whispers of him reach Tokyo, leading characters to believe Kenji may actually still be alive, as the song on the radio is the same that Kana has had all these years, but, but the song she's been listening to never had an ending, and this one does. Let's list through those themes for Kenji real quick, because it's here that the theme of heroism is now reaching its climax. After Bloody New Year's Eve, Kenji runs away and spent the last 17 years unable to remember who he was because of the trauma of what feels like his fault. He repressed his identity as Kenji Endo and chose to forget. After the Expo assassination event and the friend having revived himself, becoming global news, he could no longer run away and he spent then three days and nights crying and expressing his pain deep in the mountains of Japan. Because of this, he's become somewhat of a shell of who he used to be. That optimistic attitude of cooking his special fried rice has almost all but dried up. He's now a man with nothing but his music, singing his song of hope to men with guns pointing right at him, almost bewildered that they can't shoot him. And crowds of people follow him, the man of music, tearing through barricades and makeshift castles that pretend to be built with stone. A hero. But Kenji knows he isn't one. This all happened because of him. The pain and atrocities of this world are his fault. He tried to play hero, and it was useless, so he ran away hoping the problems would just die. But they don't. He now sees that heroes are not perfect, or you even need to be one to try again and fix what you caused. He expresses this. He is not a messiah or a brilliant musician. If someone wants to shoot you, regardless if you're singing a very emotional, beautiful song, they will shoot you. We are not children anymore, and the world should not be privy to this ridiculous game. Kenji isn't trying to play the hero, and he is not hesitating to do what he needs to. He is now a jaded adult, maybe like some of us who want a lot of terrible things he has seen not to happen again. Tokyo in this part has been reshaped to the friend's liking, the town he grew up in, a time he wishes to return to, and something every adult I think will think upon once in their lifetime. A simpler one, and really shows the true crux of the theme of time and growing up. If you remain stuck in the past, and refuse to face your future and change everything to be like it was, it's just a bad lie that won't satisfy you. And Friend is full of these bad lies. That is how Kenji stacks up against Friend. One has accepted his past and who he is now, and is ready for a future to begin. And the other, Friend, acts like an evil child. He teases Kenji because for him, he is in the past. It is seen many times, but everything the Friend tries to create, like the robot, is just not what it seems. It's not an evil shadow, it's a hunk of junk wrapped in cloth. The Friend cannot float, it's just stage trickery. The Friend did not come back to life, it is just another Friend that was waiting to take the reins all along. It's all smoke and mirrors, and enough of it fooled the entire world. Except for the virus, that one is pretty real. I mean, the symbol was cool and creepy though, right? You probably think Urasawa spent days researching the occult and looking at thousands of their symbols so that he create the perfect emblem of the villains. Nope, it's a symbol that was drawn by Ocho, because the hand symbol used in magazines and because he had large eyes as a child that he got teased about. That's it. it shows how much the things we are scared of are actually just made up of things that don't really have any meaning. I mentioned before that the quality of part three is where the story starts to crack under the weight of everything it needs to do. And there are many great moments in part three as well. Characters finally reunite, and Kenji faces villains and reconnects with new and old characters who are in the old western style connected by fate or chance. But I feel it difficult to really expand on everything I love about part three and its stories. There's so many, there's the members of Kenji's band, Kiriko and the Vaccine, the secret inside the Tower of the Sun, Manjomi's coup d'etat, Kana's leadership, the second robot, the expedition to Mars, the flying saucers, Kana taking friend hostage. There is a lot. And I think one of the reasons why I love this manga and consider it to be one of the best things I've ever read is because there is so much to experience in its mystery and most of all its characters. I mean, there was so much I didn't discuss in part two with Fukube's backstory in the science room as well. But part three is also the result of some mysteries not being clear cut and tied up in a bow. Plot points of Kana having powers are never really determined by a magical law. They are at first obscure and then become too specific. Some characters feel like they never got their final development or personal reward, like seeing their families after 17 years of being criminals. Part 3 also introduces all these new possible storylines that never get any kind of successful resolution and are introduced extremely late or are very old, don't get resolved. Miss Takesu carrying the child of the friend. There's no resolution there. The 
FDP mentioned cloning procedures and that the friend had found a way to live forever. That's never mentioned again. The friend even having maybe clones versions of themselves in the Tower of the Sun, that, that was not what it seemed to be. Final plan is the virus. Oh, actually, no, it's the anti-proton bond. Kenji faces the friend who wants him to admit what he did as a child. He does, and then the friend gets mad, even though that's what he wanted. He dies, and then we go to the virtual world. It really becomes convoluted to the point where complexity is no longer a positive point of the story. It's what made the story intriguing, but at this point in the story, it's just making it too hard to finish. Some of these incomplete plot lines actually affect parts one and two, which suddenly feel less important and make less sense when you go back and read. I had been thinking for a while about why the story falters so much in this last act. Besides needing to wrap up so much, what is it that affects the trajectory of the series? Well, I have some answers before hitting home and ending what is most likely a hellish fucking video for me to edit. I think it's the friend. I was going to talk about how the resurrected friend and his true identity kind of almost retcon everything about the villain and who he is as a character. The flashbacks of the first friend, Fukube, and then the second friend, Katsumata, who they were and what was their emotional state. But it all doesn't really make sense the more you really try and figure it out. It's like time travel. The more you really think about it, the more it makes less sense. So I'm not going to talk about the reveals and backstories because to me, that's not what made friend great. And I think it's one of the reasons why it made the epilogue not that great. Similar to characters like Joker, it's more interesting when you don't really know where he came from, or should not be too complicated to explain his origins. In Friend's case, it is extremely complicated and to me was not the highlight of the ending. At one point, I thought he was a man-made experiment. It would explain his childlike tendencies and wish to be young and unaware of what he was but desires praise, but that ended up getting debunked. Having friend be revived regenerates the mystery of the antagonist, but now the messages and themes of the story become more skewed and less applicable to the villain because it's not the same guy. I had heard the epilogue wasn't loved, and I do feel that here there are Urasawa fans who claim he does not nail home endings, as he doesn't plan too far ahead when creating the manga. He quote, lets the story go where it feels it should. And I think that is a valuable creative headspace to have that makes people thrive when making stories. And again, this man was making Monster, finished it, and then started another manga before finishing 20th Century Boys, which was based on one of the most famous manga of all time. Add up the lack of sleep and lack of free time, and it almost starts to make sense that there was a reason for some large plot holes, and I'll even say inconsistencies with characters like Kana and the friend. I think the thing that makes all of the epilogue and final chapters of this manga seem a bit disappointing, the more I think, it just keeps going back to Friend. Do I think Friend is a bad villain? No. He does everything he needs to. He terrifies us with social power he wields. His identity is intriguing, but also adds to his presence. An unseen enemy who you don't know and cannot fight like any other is almost more horrific don't know what they want, or maybe just why. Friend is a compelling antagonist, but was he a compelling character? No, not to me. His identity and who he was made his presence lacking. Getting Fukube's backstory was really cool, and hearing of the second friend being an imposter was also a great move. It's horrifying when even the villains don't know what this guy is thinking, but it begins to unravel as all the context we had which revolved around unveiling who it was, fell apart very quickly as this second friend had the agenda to destroy the world, not just take it over. That made sense for Fukube because he was the one on the outside looking in. He wanted to be a part of Kenji's group and be accepted and liked by them. He was Collins revolving around that small moon, looking beyond wishing to be a part of something, be seen and be heard. And that is a very relatable feeling. But when that motivation disappears for a second antagonist who wanted to be Fukube, the theme almost cracks, and you can feel plot elements and character motivations being made out of almost thin air sometimes. It's like writing something you can't fit on the page, so you're trying to shorten every word, make your writing smaller, and squeeze it together to keep yourself from running out of room. There was a retcon in the epilogue, with the final chapter revealing Katsumata as the friend the whole time which would have made perfect sense from the beginning, but along the way, Urasawa took the story where he felt it had to go, creating the two people both being friend. Now, I wanted to spend the beginning of this video talking about what I like because I do feel what doesn't work in the story sticks out like a sore thumb. I feel the need to be overly critical of the elements of the manga that didn't hit home for me because 
I really enjoyed reading it more than I actually thought I would. I think one of the reasons is because of the circumstances the characters are in. I remember my childhood well and miss it. I think about where I might be in the future, maybe too much or not actually enough. There is the human nature of the characters to become so scared of the past or future that they run from the problems they created, or from friends who needed help, or from those who wanted to help them. We never end up seeing the final battle of Bloody New Year's Eve, and how Kenji made it out alive, or the trauma he felt from that event shocking him to lose his sense of self. And there was actually a real-life reason for this. A real-life tragedy. It was just a few weeks before the events of 9-11, and I had just delivered the manuscript for a chapter where these two giant robots fight and level all the tall buildings of Shinjuku. And I saw the real-life tragedy of that event in New York, I didn't have the heart to illustrate that scene anymore. So instead, I delivered nearly a whole chapter of Kenji just singing his song. At the time, I'm sure it was unheard of in a manga story, but I wanted Kenji to express how I felt at that moment. The scene Urasawa is referencing is one that I haven't ever seen before in a manga, at least not to this extent. Kenji feels invincible with his guitar ever since he was a little kid and always wanted to be a successful musician when he had no home, was living underground out of fear for his loved ones and wished to be the hero he thought he could be, that others thought he could be. He would play on the streets even if it was to no one. This scene shows that. The lyrics of his song of hope that we've been hearing all through part three and two. And because Urasawa himself is a music head, he has the notes that accompany it. Now, I can't read music or have the talent to sing in the key. And we ask what key, I mean all of them. But injecting this music is more than just a character trait, as it becomes a piece of the plot to help create a movement which is a callback to early references in the story about Woodstock and the peace movement when Kenji returns to Tokyo 17 years later. Kenji said the song is a mix of Bob Dylan and John Lennon, as he admired both of them. And so the song came to be known as Bob Lennon, known to readers today. It actually exists renditions you can listen to from the live action films and fan versions online. But this reflects Urasawa as an artist and Kenji, and now returning with that same song facing his past and accepting his present, the character who can grow and create a future. I'm in love with this manga because of what it says to me. In spite of the problems with structure and writing, because I still loved the personable characters, the time skips, and the introspective conversations of just everyday people finding the courage to try and save the world. Thanks for watching and making it to the end of this video. There is so much more I want to include, but I don't want to get into the habit of making too long a video on every manga I read, so I'm actually glad you stuck around. Besides that, if you enjoyed my ramble, please like the video and let me know your thoughts on 20th Century Boys below. We can discuss this as I feel there's so much to pick apart in this manga. And actually by the time you're watching this video, I've launched a second channel to post content not related to manga, but more video games and other media in general I really like. So if you want to hear my thoughts on some of my favorite games, music, movies, television shows, and books even, uh, go have a look. That's all from me, guys. I appreciate making it to the end of the video. My name's Mugen. As always, have a good one.